Do you know what they call alternative medicine that's been proven to work? Medicine. Welcome to the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast, a show about energy healing, holistic, and plant medicine. Our passion is healing on all levels. You'll hear guests from doctors, yoga teachers, energy healers, researchers, coaches, and real people who've recovered from serious debilitating health conditions, getting to the root of the problem and solving it. And this is not medical advice. Welcome to the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast. And now your host, William Dickinson. Hello and welcome. Today we are joined by Emily Simpson. She has healed from chronic slash terminal illnesses. So very, very serious stuff going on here under many different labels. And now she uses the knowledge, wisdom and experience that she's gained to empower other, others in their health as well. She's passionate about dismantling the concept of disease and cultivating a life that supports living wellness. That is such a wonderful catchphrase. I absolutely love that. <laughs> dismantling the concept of disease and facilitating living wellness that's that's exactly what this podcast is about so I would I always like to start this by asking you how did you get into this Emily so you've obviously talked about chronic disease and terminal illness I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and how you got into this yes so this is really fascinating because growing up I think I always had a little bit of an interest in healing in general and I was really, really blessed to be exposed to many, like I had a Christian father, a Catholic mother, an aunt who taught Native American spirituality, um, a Puerto Rican grandmother, German grandfather. Wow. So it's like I had a lot of influence of different spirituality, different religion, all of the contexts and hues that came with that. And as a teen, I got very into energy healing and chakras and that sort of thing. And conventional health was not really like on my radar. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then as I started getting older and my health declined and around 18 was when things really like into total health decline. And I went through the conventional medical system and really like got a personal experience of what that was like, where some of the benefits may lie, and a lot of the huge inherent cracks that people tend to slip through and what's not working. And then also went through the all the alternative health paradigm because that's, you know, kind of tends to be the route when we go this way. We it's go through step. conventional medicine. Yeah, exactly. And what I started to find was that it's a different label and it's often far less toxic in terms of the substances being used. There's more coherency, more empathy, I think just more wholeness to it. But ultimately, a lot of the mindsets are actually really, really similar. Very so similar. people go to alternative health and they think they're in a new paradigm and they're really not. Mm -hmm. And then I can, I can understand what you mean there. It's almost like you've gone from here's a, here's a pill, here's a medication to here's a supplement, here's a plant. It's, it's slightly exactly. different, but it's still following the same sort of model. Absolutely. And then after that, I progressed to experimental was part of studies was, you know, doing things that many people would consider cutting edge medicine but doesn't truthfully have a lot of ground behind mm -hmm. it. And quite honestly, I think it did a lot more damage than good. Like if wow. I could redo my health journey over, it would, <laughs> you know, knowing what I know now, I don't think it, I would have ever gotten to the degree of health decline that I did. But it was basically through this whole experience that it solidified for me, I was like, wow, this is an entire piece of life and society and wellness that it just felt to me like we are totally missing this and looking because I became a, a research 
fiend for my own case first, as I think <laughs> many of us do. We yes. just consume everything possible really to, to heal ourselves. And like looking at the numbers and the rates of chronic degenerative terminal illness exponentially rising in younger and younger populations, there was just this like, okay, something that we're doing is not working. And it was also, for me, it was not working. I, I actually came to the point in my journey where it really was like the practitioners, the doctors I were working, was working with were like, we don't know what to do with to you. That point. It was just kind of like, good luck. Um, yeah. I can relate. <laughs> that was the same for me too. I feel like that's sort of the fire you have to go through to forge into what you're doing now is you really have to get to the point where other people are like, we don't really know what's going on. And then they're kind of like, well, you just kind of got to deal with it. And you're like, okay, well, let's figure this out then. Because at that point, you can't outsource that responsibility anymore. You know, it's all on your back. Exactly. And that's really, I think, more so than anything, my work, my passion in this work really distills down to how do we stop outsourcing our personal power for healing? And how do we outsource in the correct way in terms of outsourcing for support, not outsourcing for answers and outsourcing for healing? And it was that's kind of what I'm going to get into today are the major turning points, the major shifts that happened in my healing that took me from like survival mode, steady health decline into true healing and wellness. Because I think a lot of people, I get asked this question all the time, like what were the major turning points? Yeah. And <laughs> Everyone is always expecting to hear that it was this dietary change or working with this person or this healing modality. And it, it wasn't any of those things. It was, and I will say all of those things, the clarity for what I needed in terms of diet and movement and support all came as byproducts of these deeper shifts, which are primarily around not outsourcing your mm -hmm. healing, not outsourcing your wellness to someone else. And this, this concept of living wellness was very intentional because when we shift the perspective from treating disease, treating illness, treating symptoms, treating a label that often has very little behind it in terms of real understanding, and we bring the focus onto how do I create a life that supports my wellness when we consider that every single thing in your life from how you wake up in the morning to who you talk to, to what you consume, to how you're feeling when you consume it and go about these things are all inputs. They're all stimuli and your body receives all of those inputs and then expresses those as an output that we perceive as our overall presentation of health. So when we consider that and we're seeing the body expressing an attempt to heal, which we label as symptoms and disease, it's then about how do I change the stimuli happening in my life to support this healing process rather than triggering and fighting against myself. <laughs> wow, that is, if, if, if listeners can can conceptualize and understand what it is you've actually just said there like that's the, that's the paradigm shift in itself isn't it there's no there's no one therapy or one treatment or one practitioner or one supplement it's 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 understanding what you just said there and actually being able to truly implement it but i think this is why it's so difficult and why people look for the one supplement the one practitioner the one therapy is what you've just said is absolutely individual for every single person so how yes. would a person go about figuring out how to do this themselves? I would say this is, this is going to take me into exactly my first point is what you said is right. that there is no one thing. And I know <laughs> we've all heard that. And I feel like at least for me on my journey, it was like, I kind of got that at a mental level and it was like, oh yeah, there's no one thing. 
but there's still, I will say that that information tends to land. I see for people in the way of like, we have a mental awareness, a light bulb goes off, Mm -hmm. we get something conceptually. And then it takes time for that to really land at the emotional level. And that's the place where people, they hear there's no one thing and they're like, yeah, I got that. But at the the emotional level, they're still seeking uh, the thing that mm-hmm. works and this is sort of it's the major band-aid that I have to rip off with people and really start to process the emotional layers and truthfully the fear that is under there of like what does that mean if there is no one thing if there is no one practitioner and I think I won't go super deeply into this subcomponent today mm-hmm. but there's a very potent conversation to be had there around self-trust on the healing Mm -hmm. journey because we outsource due to the lack of trust in our own ability to one perceive the signals our body is sending us two understand them and three respond to them appropriately to support healing so we kind of we take (laughs) our life and we lay it in the hands of a doctor Mm. or a practitioner and it people are you know there's no fault here like we're very trained into this dynamic of seeing a practitioner of any kind as an authority in the room and so there's this automatic assumption that happens where when you walk into a doctor's office or a coaching scenario or a health practitioner's office, most people sort of automatically revert into this space of this person is the expert. They know more than I do. And so Mm -hmm. we kind of, there's this internal collapse that happens. And so it's about cultivating the self-trust. And I will say just briefly for everyone, I really think a huge part of that is giving yourself the spaciousness to experiment on your healing journey Mm. of trying different things and knowing that you will get it wrong. You will trigger symptom flares. You will activate healing crises. Like it, it it will not always be comfortable. It, there will be pain. There will be struggle. There will be days that you don't know what to do. (laughs) Like, yes, I agree will inherently uh, take you to your deepest fears and take you to the unknown. Because if what we were doing and where we're at was working, we'd already be healed. So it's like we have to leave the paradigm and the box of what we know. And when we get out there, it's like, oh my God, I'm really out here. Mm -hmm. And like, do, do I have the fortitude in myself to stand through this journey, regardless of if someone else is behind me or not, if my practitioners agree, if my partner and my parents and like, because there's so many influences along the journey of what to do and what to choose. Um, But I would say, rather than searching for the one thing, my philosophy is optimizing the foundational components the foundational inputs of our life and a mentor of mine refers to these as the eight of the eight essentials i call them the areas of influence i add a few more things than he does this is tommy john by the way if anyone's curious but it's optimizing your why your intention your purpose behind what you're doing and you'll find that you can take a hundred people struggling with the same thing, put them on the exact same protocols, time periods, all of it. And really like the differentiating factor is going to be that person's intention. Are they doing this with heart? Do they actually believe in what they're choosing? Is there a deep reason, a belief, a feeling, an emotion behind it that they're connected to, or are they just going down a checklist? And that's, 
that's, I think the first huge piece is making your healing and your medicine true to you. Is it something that you are deeply choosing because it feels like a yes, or if not a full bodied yes, at least a curiosity in your body? Or is it just, I'm ticking the boxes because I was told this is what to do. And that's, that's the outsourcing that mm -hmm. happens. Well, that leads and... me to a very interesting question because yes, please. It, I find it's very easy to say these things now when you have this level of communication, this depth of understanding of your own emotion. It's easy to say it because I'm the same. I say this, the same things in my sessions with my clients. But what can someone do if they don't know what a full body yes is? That, what is that? They have no idea what that actually feels like. They're, they're very out of touch with their own instincts. How do they... How do they guide themselves using their instincts if their internal guidance system isn't always pointing them in the right direction? Or even if it is, they don't know how to read it properly. Yes. I, and I love this. And this is so true because it's, <laughs> I don't care what we're talking about. It can be health, business, relationships, anything with people. If you ask someone, what do you want? What feels like a yes? Almost always, unless they have done, you know, a, a depth of emotional work to some degree, the feedback that comes back is what they don't want. Mm -hmm. And most of us are trained into experiencing life through this lens of what I don't want. It's, we're not actually, and this is so true, I'll break this down in the healing journey dynamic, is the difference between walking towards wellness for the sake of wellness versus just trying to avoid pain, avoid illness. So I would say, if you don't have that reference point in your body, if you're the person who's like, I don't even know. And I very much was that person. I was so dissociated from my own body, from the sensations. It was just kind of like numbness when I first started to tap in. It was like, how can I follow my body's feedback when I can't even feel the feedback? And so many of us are in that state because we're taught to override. Like mm -hmm. if you're tired, have another energy drink, more caffeine, push through it. If you don't like how you're feeling, push through it. So it's a good reference point to start with is what doesn't feel good because that's often far more clarified. We are mm -hmm. usually more attuned with the pain, more attuned with what a no feels like. And you can mm -hmm. think of... Um, <laughs> think of your least favorite politician is always a good one and you'll feel that like, <laughs> gut feeling <laughs> yeah. for people yeah and in my experience it is usually some form of a contraction a tension a closing on some level mm -hmm. so noticing that embodied reference point and if you're doing this with specific items sometimes I will actually have clients do that is it's like take a page fold it in half write what you don't want on one side because that's usually easier to identify and then you would just look at on the other side what's the opposite experience of I've done that. the very same exercise with my clients exactly the same it's yes uh, it's like the the steps to manifestation the first is the law of contrast you have to understand what you don't want to become very clear about what you do want it's very interesting exactly. that you've tuned into the exact same thing that i have i thought i find that uncanny that you can come to the exact same approach the exact same practical application and we've never spoken about it before it makes me think like <laughs> maybe we're tuned into something you know <laughs> oh absolutely and i think also i mean this is True is true is true, no matter where you put it. And that's why I find that people who really grasp healing at the foundational level, you will always see, it might be like a little variation of expression or how it's communicated, but you'll see the same fundamental pieces, mm -hmm. ideas, concepts woven throughout all of it, just, you know, expressed with the beautiful uniqueness of each person. So with that in mind, could you take us back to the first, the first big shift that began to sort of lay this foundation for understanding health healing as you currently do now? Because I really think you get it. It's like you just said, when you see some, when you get it and you see someone that gets it, 
you, you, you know, you can tell by what they're talking about, by the essence of what it is they're trying to convey. So what is it for you that started moving you towards this current perspective that you have? Was there like, a, I know there's no like one thing, but what was the first thing that really began to shift your perspective on this? Yeah, it was the realization that there was no one thing. It was like when <laughs> I really, it was leaving the paradigm of outsourcing. And I will say it was terrifying. I, I want to be really clear because it's like <laughs> exactly how you're saying. It's easy for me to sit here now having healed and be in a state of wellness and talk about this. And it, it feels easy now because I've done it, but the doing of it was not easy. It was the journey itself that built mm -hmm. what is here now. So when I first, you know, walked out of <laughs> those offices and was like, wow, I'm really going to do this on my own now, I was terrified. And I had every person in the world, I had experts in medicine telling me, this is crazy. You're stupid for walking away. My parents were worried. Like, so it was. I, I just want to say that so it's no one feels weight. like I'm not supposed to feel fear because yeah, yes, heavy. absolutely you will. Definitely. And the, the shift internally was it was like, what happens when you start stop outsourcing your healing to other people is there's this sensation of like settling, of coming home. Because what I find is when we're outsourcing, we are constantly looking for the thing in terms of diet, in terms of movement, in terms of medicine, and whatever it is. And there is this low level panic that we live in because when you outsource and when you make the diet the thing that's going to heal you, and it's... It's so beautifully intended, but I don't actually agree with the sentiment that like food is healing. We hear that a lot as a mm -hmm. shift from like, you know, from phar pharmaceuticals more into the alternative world. It's food that heals. I don't actually agree. Food beautifully supports your healing, but it doesn't actually heal you. At the end of the day, it was coming home to the truth that your body is intelligently, innately designed to heal. If you watch a human body, it will always move towards wellness. It, and when you understand your symptoms, they actually are the evidence of this. So it's flipping the perspective a little bit on understanding that mm. even when you're sitting there and it feels brutal, you're in pain, you're having a flare, knowing, I'm not saying don't feel the frustration. Don't feel like none of that bypassing stuff. Like, yes, feel those things. And also at the same time, realize that every single one of those symptoms has great purpose behind it to heal you. For example, like we look at a cold and we think, oh, I have to get rid of the fever. I need to get rid of the sneezing. But it, when you understand the miracle that a fever really is, like your body has identified a pathogen, identified that that pathogen cannot survive at a certain temperature, adjusted itself to raise, to make an environment inhospitable to that, generated inflammation and fluid to bring nutrients and blood flow and flush different areas to move those things out. We're causing sneezing and coughing to expel that. And I, I really like to highlight this just because when we have this idea that my body is against me, my symptoms are happening to me. And this is, it, it's personal for me because I come from the autoimmune world and this is so instilled and it creates this internal sense of separation and inherent distrust. And it starts to become this dynamic of it's me against my body. I'm fighting myself. And in that battle, you will never win. If it's you fighting you, you will always destroy yourself mm -hmm. no matter what move you make. So it's firstly, can we get you back on the page of seeing, even though it's uncomfortable, yes, you can be in pain. Yes, you can be angry. Yes, you can grieve. Yes, you can do all those things. And at the same time, hold you know the seeming paradox of 
even though this might be brutal, it's happening for me. And how can I learn to support this? Like, obviously, we don't want you to stay there, but we want to have the understanding that that is not your body in breakdown. That is not your body fighting against you. That is your body making the biggest attempt it possibly can to come back towards wellness. And when we understand the depth of how much your body is actually on your side, how much it is designed to heal and always come towards wellness, there is sort of a relaxing that can happen in terms of, I don't have to find the thing outside of me. It's already here. It's, it's not about finding what works. It's about supporting what already is and that that panic can stop because we're not dependent on this thing out here. Because when you're dependent on someone outside of you or something outside of you, there is always this low level sense of like, because it can go away. Mm -hmm. And if it fails and we see this over and over again, and it's, it breaks my heart. And I did this so much on my journey where you repeatedly choose protocols, choose diets, choose new practices, and then they fail. And that happens over and over and over again. It starts to bolster and form the subconscious belief that nothing I ever do works and nothing I ever do will work when it's not really, <clears throat> it's not that any of that is even necessarily not working. It's that you were in such a state of panic and fear and misalignment to begin with that it probably wasn't actually aligned. One mm -hmm. first piece mm -hmm. comes back to that. Why is like, oftentimes we choose those things, not because they're deeply true, but because we've been told this is what to do. So we just kind of hop in without any real investment behind it. Then we have this fear of the outsourcing and <clears throat> it's just like this, this perfect slew of factors for that thing to not give you the optimum amount of what's available, even if it was aligned for you, because you were in such state of tension and contraction and fear and needing to make it work that you couldn't relax enough mm -hmm. to receive that medicine anyways. Okay. okay so to, to distill what you're saying, see if I understand it correctly is when you're in this place where you're externalizing your your healing to a supplement to a practitioner to a provider to anything outside of your own body's innate healing intelligence you're actually in a way in for in resistance to healing because you're yes you're, you're not embodying it in yourself you're 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 separate from it you've pushed it away it's something else it's an external it's an externality so you're effectively in resistance to it so what you're saying is the external influence can only work if you're already whole. It can't be completing you. You need to be complete. And then this supplementary effects are enabling the inner healing ability to work because you're already all, all the way there. Well, it makes it much easier. I will mm -hmm. say it, it's, I wouldn't say necessary only for this reason, because if we look at the body and how it works, it's like, regardless of whether you choose to get into alignment or not, your body will fight for you till it's dying breath. It will give you everything it's got with no thank you, with no acknowledgement, mm -hmm. with no support, with no anything. So it's like that healing just is. It, and it's <laughs> what I like people to see is this concept of like, you don't have to get yourself to heal. You couldn't stop the healing process if you tried. That's like, that's why we're in mm. so much pain and suffering is because your body keeps trying to heal no matter mm. how out of alignment we get, but so it's in a place yes. of resistance instead of allowing, because the body exactly. is already trying to pull you towards that. And you're sort of preventing it. You're in resistance yes. to that. Okay. So, so how would someone become aware of what they're doing and whether it is in a resisting energy or whether it's in an allowing energy? I would say. The first part of this is, let me contemplate how I want to word this here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a big one. <laughs> it, 
is it's through the self-experimentation with the shift, the, the words that went through my head were, I'm going to make my body's feedback number one. Mm -hmm. And it comes back to that thing of give yourself the spaciousness to experiment, to do it wrong and to start gathering feedback, gathering context. And instead of looking at what you're trying in terms of this failed or succeeded based on, did I get to where I want to be with my health? Can you take it as context and use everything as, okay, if this didn't work, then something else will. Like all that's doing is building context for what is actually going to support me. So, <clears throat> so it's putting less weight on whatever it is that you're trying. Yes. Less like, this has to be the thing. Absolutely. And it's, it's that part of recognizing your own body signals. First, it's can we actually recognize them? Sometimes if someone is super, super dissociated <clears throat> from their own body, and I did this in my journey, is I will actually have them set a timer can be for every hour, every couple hours, you know, whatever works in your life. And to just notice every time that timer goes off, can you identify what are you feeling in your body? Like, are you actually aware of what your feet feel like? Can you feel the texture of your socks? Can you feel the temperature of the room? Can you, after you eat, um, are you noticing this meal makes me heavy versus makes me lighter? Mm. This energizes me versus depletes me. So it's, I start to give a lot of exercises that are based on finding reference points in the body. <clears throat> and then the, the experimentation comes in of how do we respond to those and to, to bring this back to the eight essentials, the areas of life that you want to really look at and check in with how am I doing in all of these is your why, your intention, your purpose belief in something bigger. This is really fascinating. I think it was Joe Dispenza. They interviewed a ton of people who were healing incurable things. Mm -hmm. And the top identifying factor between them all was belief in something bigger, which to me really translates like <clears throat> in the context of when you understand that there is something, I don't care what you label it, God, source, the universe, whatever works for you in your life but there is a force, something bigger than us out there. It opens you and there becomes mm -hmm. the sense of curiosity because another piece of this is people get so boxed in by research, by testimonials, by statistics, because it's presented in such a way as if it's solid information and it's not. And I'm not going to say that there's no value to it. Like, is there? Yes, absolutely. But you also have to take that in the context of all medicine is a practice. You could never be defined by a study. You could never be defined by even a testimonial of success. I, I say even the same thing about this, because often we're like perusing, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, who else healed and it, it can be just as damaging as perusing who else didn't because they're not in your body. They're not in your experience. It doesn't matter what worked for anyone else. Mm -hmm. Does it work for you? And the only way to find that is to get deeply embedded hands in the dirt in your own life and take the context from your body itself. But having that, the belief in something bigger keeps us open, keeps us mm -hmm. curious, keeps us available to possibility and this concept of even if I'm feeling boxed in, even if I'm feeling like there's no hope, there's no way, even if it hasn't been discovered yet, it could be tomorrow. And we are just for people's reference, something to really think about is like, there are billions of people studying the human body and studying medicine round the clock every second of every day. And we are quite literally learning more than we can keep up with, mm -hmm. than we can implement into practice and education. So it's like, it, it is that vast. And when we get that at an emotional embodied level, it's like that out breath, that sigh of like, okay, even if it looks bleak right now, <clears throat> there might be 
<laughs> some hope here. Mm -hmm. And then the next pieces are your rest, your nourishment, your movement, your relationships, your breath, and your connection with nature and sunlight. It is through these eight areas and you know, wealth could be spoken on each of them yes. individually. I want a whole podcast there, episode but... <laughs> each, I'm sure. Yes, but optimizing those through the feedback of your own body mm -hmm. and making the wellness yours. And I would encourage everyone uh, go through your protocol, look at what you're doing, what you're taking, how you're moving. If you don't have a reason behind it, stop doing it. That I mean, that's the first place. Bring healing home to is it actually true for you? <laughs> and I, I really love all of those things that you mentioned. And it, it reminds me of, there's a, there's, a, there's a statistical principle called a Pareto distribution, which is where 20% of the work that you do will make 80% of the outcome. You can see this, this, this is almost like a universal scale. It happens in, in businesses, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. 20% of the population own 80% of the wealth. And it really is applicable to just about everything. And the same is true in healing. If you focus on the 20% of your effort. So this is from what I'm seeing, these eight things that you're really talking about here, the, the basics, get the basics, right? That's 80% of your healing. And yes. the thing that I really like about Pareto distributions is they scale. So with inside a Pareto distribution, you also have another Pareto distribution. So if you calculate the maths, that's like, 4% of your effort is 64% of your outcome. So if you really focus on that 4% of the th of all of the things that you can do, focus on the 4% that really matters, that's going to give you 64% of your healing. And it's 4% is what it sounds way less overwhelming than all of these things. You've got to try all of these therapies, all of these yes. diets. It's like through your own body, figure out what the 4% is for you. And you're over halfway there already just by doing that little 4%. Exactly. And it's, it's the, the everyday consistency. Like we think about, you know, it's all this stuff. We got to mm -hmm. take a million supplements and do all these different things. And then we're in a freeze state because we're overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. It's like <laughs> the, your healing protocol for many people becomes the thing that is actually causing more detriment because there's so much stress mm -hmm. to keep up with it or to restrict themselves onto it. And this is sort of a conversation, you know, we were having previously privately is this concept of restriction rebellion. And uh, what I want to touch on here is <clears throat> one of my clients asked me this just the other day. It was a brilliant question. And I've spoken about it again and again since, because it's so potent. She said, she asked me, okay, that's great. But like, what did you do on your healing journey when holiday came and you wanted a break from it? or when you were on vacation or like, how did you, how did you stick to it? And what I really like to get at with people is living wellness. When you cultivate a life that supports your wellness, there won't be the sensation of having to stick to it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there won't be this element of having to force or restrict or like keep yourself in these lines, it will naturally support you. And that's not to say that it won't ever be uncomfortable because it will, <laughs> like we won't love everything we do. And the example I always give with this is I'm rehabilitating some structural like car accident impact injuries and doing movements. Doing those movements hurts immensely. Mm -hmm. Like bringing your body into realignment doesn't always feel good. But because I have a deep connection, the why behind it, the reason and the knowing of what I'm moving towards, there's still a desire even through the discomfort to show up for that practice. And it doesn't, it's not a box that I'm ticking of like, mm -hmm. oh, I did my movements to heal this there. It's like how present, how much of yourself can you pour into what you're doing and exactly what you're saying. It's like, if you poured all of yourself all of your heart all of your intention all of your presence into four percent of the things that you're doing fully and just let the rest go you would still heal significantly mm -hmm. if not fully from that it's not really about 
doing more. It's about being more in the simplicity of what you are doing. And I find simplistic is generally better for people. Your what that. is true healing for you <laughs> is not going to be complex. Mm -hmm. It's simple. That's that's exactly it. It's like you don't have to think about how to breathe, about how to make your heart beat, about how to blink. You're not consciously controlling all of these things. They're simple. It, your body knows how to do it. And if you can just come back to that essence of the simplicity of of healing, if you cut your finger, you don't sit there and like look at it and think like, I'm going to heal this. I'm going to imagine all of the exactly. immune cells. Actually, it, it does it by itself. So it's yes. a, it's really an allowing, an easy, soft, gentle allowing process. And being yes. able to allow that to happen is is really where the, the true healing comes from. But it can be very difficult moving into that because to hold space for this, you have to be able to hold all of your fears, all of your doubts, all of your uncertainties. You can have flare-ups of symptoms. I actually had a, a client recently said she had a flare-up of all of her symptoms. And when you're in the symptoms, it feels like the whole world is coming to an end. You're like, I've yes. gone back. I've regressed on progress. Like this food is bad. Like this is happening. This is all really bad. And it's like this chaos. But it's like, the thing that I told her was, you don't heal in spite of your symptoms and in spite of your flare-ups. You heal because of them. They're the gateway. Yes. They're the channel to the next thing. But in order for you to be able to hold space for that and feel safe within yourself and not think, oh, I'm panicking. I have to outsource it. I need to go to the ER. I need to restrict this food. I need to do something to control the situation is very difficult. And it's a process that takes time. You build yes. courage within yourself. You build safety in yourself by practicing. It's not something you can fake. It's not something you can force. It's just something you have to focus as much as you can on with the little bit that you're able to, even if it's just a small bit and just keep doing that and it will begin to grow. Yes. And that I would say is sort of um, <laughs> the next huge, huge shift is I worded this as taking the impact of stress and compounding trauma and nervous system dysregulation seriously, but it's really, <clears throat> it's taking safety seriously mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's taking cultivating safety in your own body seriously because plain and simple the body heals best in a state of safety when we are regulated when we are relaxed when we're in you know our parasympathetic state like everything every process for healing is optimized in that state detoxification digestion absorption like everything and when we're in these levels of sort of chronic fight or flight or chronic freeze, and most of us are, <clears throat> we're used to living there, that's having an impact on your body's ability to heal. And also for the fact of exactly what you're saying, because healing will inherently, it's going to show you every misalignment in your life so you can course correct to mm -hmm. come into alignment with wellness. I love that. So it's, yeah. So it's like every misalignment in your diet, every misalignment in your relationships, your environment. So it's like, sometimes when people start to heal, I find that there's the sensation of like a reality collapse or the mm -hmm. rug being pulled out from under them. And then usually this ensuing overwhelm of like, oh my God, I don't even know where to start. Like it's everything. How do I, and the first piece is always nervous system regulation mm -hmm. because this is what's going to give you the capacity and the resiliency for mm -hmm. when the fear comes, when the challenge comes. And it exactly what you're saying, it's a practice. It really, <laughs> mm -hmm. courage implies fear. It's not about yes. never having fear. It's about how do I build the capacity and the resiliency to walk with this fear? How do I see it, understand it, respond to it and caretake it while also not letting it run my life? Yes, and I will say also, you'll have the spirals of the times that you do. Like in general, I'll say 99% of everything I attempted on my healing journey failed. Like <laughs> that was how I figured out what worked was the failure over and over and over again. And I had many trips to the emergency room, um, some that were unfounded, some that were like there were 
both sides of the spectrum. There were times I went where it was like, I was just freaked out because I had never encountered this before, like in the beginning. So I was running to the doctor for Mm -hmm. every little thing. Then towards the end, it actually flipped. It was like, I got to know my own body so well, I could walk in and be like, in an hour, I'm going to be septic. I can feel this infection coming on. They wouldn't believe me. We'd have to sit Mm -hmm. there and wait. They'd take labs and sure enough, then we'd be there. Like, so it, (laughs) that kind of your experience of that changes over time, but it's, I guess my point is to really take the impact of the stress in your life seriously, because we hear so often lower your stress levels, deal with this. And it's, it's said in sort of this nebulous way. And there's usually not a lot of helpful tools given of like, how do I actually practically Mm -hmm. do this? So it just sort of goes by the wayside. And we're so focused on how do I get the right diet? How do I get my supplements and my herbs and my medicines right? And it's like, well, if you could actually cultivate safety in your body first, you might not even need half of that. Like so much more comes from stress than I think a lot of people realize. So I would say a focus on trauma integration, if you have outstanding traumas. I I liked completion process, parts work, Mm. um, polyvagal theory for nervous system dysregulation to really get an understanding of what's causing stress in your life, noticing your triggers of dysregulation and having the tools to bring yourself home. Because again, like you're not going to prevent getting triggered. You're not going to prevent getting scared, being thrown off. It's, do I know that I have the capacity and the tools to bring myself back when that happens? And then even when it's happening, it's like, there's still a sense of I've got this Mm -hmm. within the trigger. So something I've experienced, and I see this a lot, is just as your body is smart and unfathomably intelligent in the symptoms that it presents, Also in this healing experience, when the symptoms begin to flare up again, I found that it will only ever flare up symptoms to what you'll actually be able to tolerate. It never actually pushes you too far. It knows where your limit is and it will give you what makes you uncomfortable. And it has to do that because if it didn't make you uncomfortable, you wouldn't look at it. So it makes it uncomfortable enough that you have to look at it, but it's not overwhelming and it might build up and it might feel like it's becoming overwhelming, but your body knows where to stop. Have you, have you found the same experience? Oh, absolutely. And I think this is in line with the conversation of like the, <laughs> the degree of symptomology we're seeing in our body is usually the degree to which we are unaware in, uh, of where the misalignment is in our life. It's like when I look at the worst parts of my healing journey, there were so many aspects of my life that were like, deeply out of alignment Mm -hmm. and not working. I mean, to give a reference, it's like, and this is that conversation of like, it's never one thing in my opinion that either creates or heals Mm -hmm. illness. Like I grew up in a really dysfunctional family. I had a ton of outstanding traumas of all kinds. I was raised on unhealthy food. I had vaccine injury. I had like, I had, I had, I had, it Mm -hmm. was all these things. <clears throat> all extra stresses that, that pile up on the body exactly so it, it's understanding that it's a it's a compilation of all of these things that add <laughs> my train of thought went somewhere else there <laughs> so we've got this culmination of trauma of of vaccine injuries of toxicity of all of these different things and this is why we can't have one thing solve it because there's multiple problems occurring Yes. And seeing that it was, that's what I was getting at is that there were multiple areas where I wasn't addressing my health. Mm -hmm. And and in the beginning, I was still outsourcing when I was looking, I kind of went to doctors initially with this concept of like, please just make this better. Like, give me the thing that works without having to do the hard work Mm -hmm. of leaving an abusive relationship without having to do the hard work of facing the depth of like sugar addiction Mm -hmm. that I was in not really because of the sugar but because of all of this other emotional stuff Mm -hmm. uh and just like 
it's the chop wood carry water work of healing that is it's not exciting it's not flashy it's it feels very mundane and almost sort of boring I think Mm -hmm. at first when we're in this state of like looking for something outside and there's this sense when like when you first start to get what true healing is at least in my experience it was kind of like oh Mm, yeah (laughs) it reminds me of of a quote that I heard recently it was something along the lines of those of us that grew up in chaos feel like peace is boring it's yes like, absolutely it's like the, the process isn't this like fireworks exploding like this like cataclysmic orgasmic event where everything changes overnight it's like is this very almost grueling slogging through the mud just showing up every day and just taking another step and you don't have to jump a huge hurdle you don't have to do this next miracle thing try that miracle supplement it's like if you get up and you go through the day and you're you're trying, you're trying to see how you feel through the day. You're trying to build a diet that you think is going to help you. You're, you're trying things like that. That's it. Just keep taking the step. And you have, you have no control over how long it's going to take and what the, what the process is going to be like. What you do have control over is the direction that you're moving in. That's, that's all you have control over. So just make sure you're going in the right direction and just, just keep walking, keep, keep going. And sometimes you'll, you'll, some days you'll stop, you'll get stuck in the mud and you'll be like, I cannot move forward today. And that's fine. Just know that you will be able to move forward when when the time is right. And you just keep going, you keep plodding along and you get there. There's no secret sauce. There's no magic bullet. Just keep walking and you get there. Exactly. And particularly this piece of what you're sharing of, I would say this is the third mindset shift of everything that I've shared Mm -hmm. is new paradigm. There's, there's Mm -hmm. no quick fixes. Like when I, it was also real healing started to happen for me when I took off this time frame of needing to be in a yes. place that I wasn't, which was, I have immense compassion because at that point in my journey, I was in chronic pain round the clock. I mean, it was suffering like every single day. So it was not an easy, fun shift of like, you know, it's not this trite, airy, fairy thing of like, oh, just be here now. Like, (laughs) but it was, can I actually be with myself in terms of stop trying to dissociate into a fix to escape what's here? Can I sit with myself through the depth of this and, and, and be present? Because we have to be present in order to feel that bodily feedback in order to understand it in order to respond to it. And when I started setting realistic expectations of how long it might take to heal and realistic timeframes of measuring progress, because another thing that I see a lot of clients do is they're looking at their progress every single day and it will make you want to tear your hair out because- You can't see it. You can't see it on a day-to-day basis. It's like the same. It looks exactly, it looks nothing or it looks crazy erratic. Mm -hmm. It's up and down, up and down. And it's like, oh my God, what's happening? And what I really like to say to people is minimum amount that you ever want to look is like on a three month scale. Mm -hmm. And typically, even exactly, even more like a six month time frame. And are you generally trending Mm -hmm. upwards, seeing improvement? Yes. And And then it's, (laughs) <laughs> it's really hard when you, you you get to a new peak a new level of healing and then it comes back down a little bit again yeah. and when you're in that darkness it just feels so hard it feels like you've had such a bright opportunity you've been there but it's like that's the way the path goes you have to go down that bit so you can go up the higher bit that's coming it's like they're there to help they, they build your momentum they move you to the next step and then you'll get to that next step and you'll look back and you'll think oh that wasn't so bad where I was even though in the time it was absolutely unbearable, like, like, yes. you, like you described yourself, I also had severely chronic pain to the point where, and we're talking like time frames and things like that. I, I actually decided I was, I was marking X's in my calendar because I couldn't bear the pain. It's like, if I get to 14, like, that's it. I'm done. I'm, I'm out. Yeah, I can't handle exactly. it too much. Same. And yes. it got to a point where I was like, okay, I have to decide I'm either in or I'm out. It's like, I'm either yep. going to figure it out however long it takes or I'm done and I'm not going to do it. 
and part of my commitment to to figuring out was to share everything that I learned on the through the through the path through the experience so obviously that's that's why I'm here doing this now I imagine somewhat similar yes. somewhat similar to you <laughs> <laughs> but it's like even those dark days where I had six months straight where I just I, I didn't go for a week without thinking I just can't do this I need to kill myself like now I can't handle it yes. you get to a point where you're so high up the mountain you look back and you think didn't it didn't it didn't look so dark but it's like if I if I really think and try to embody back there it was it was unimaginable but the, the really the important yes. point that you need to make is even if you're going up and down like this you're not going backwards you never go backwards it's literally impossible you can't go backwards you can't untrust yourself you can't unlearn experiences you can't you cannot go backwards so even if you're going down temporarily you're not going backwards it's just a little hiccup you'll you'll pick back up you'll keep going in the right direction you cannot go backwards you, you can't. exactly no you you truly truly can't and i think there's there's a real beauty in what you're talking about that i've found and this was really true for me too and i, I was in the exact same boat it was like uh, if I have to live this way forever, I won't mm -hmm. like it was, like, I'm done. <laughs> <That's> it. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was contemplating my ways out heavily many times. And, but there's something that happens when you get to that point. And this is why I, I have a love for people working with people who are really critical because they're willing to go all in because mm -hmm. there's nothing left to lose. And most of society not just with their health, but kind of with everything is hanging out in this middle area where it's like, they're uncomfortable enough to complain, but not uncomfortable enough that they're willing to make change yet. And this is why I see oftentimes it's like, sometimes we have to really hit our own low, the depth of that before we're, we kind of crack open and we're like, all right, I'm all in. And it was, it was similarly that point for me where, you know, walking away from all those other realms on my own and people are telling me don't do it where it's like, okay, I'm, I'm either going to heal or I'm going to die trying, or I'm mm -hmm. taking yep. myself out of this madness. There was no other option. There's no plan B. <laughs> and that's really the point where self-responsibility has kicked in. It's like, from this point, yes. you can never outsource that responsibility again. It's like it's, it's where yours. ownership happens. Exactly. 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 And a, a last note on that, I would add to to people because we have such a a craving to know what the journey is going to look like in order to feel safe. I would say sometimes it is a gift to not know because mm -hmm. just like you know, now we're standing on the top of the mountain looking down and being like, mm -hmm. "Wow." I made it through that mm -hmm. in the beginning, like, had you told me on day one of my healing, uh, you know, like when I was first getting <laughs> a the diagnosis, symptoms, first yeah. learning what it was going to look like three or five years, what that level of pain, I would not have had the courage to do it. It would have, I would have mm -hmm. totally collapsed then because like, we're talking about the courage, the fortitude, the understanding, the ability is built through the journey itself. So sometimes it's it's a blessing to not know what lies ahead when you're at if you're at the beginning of your healing journey. Sometimes that's a gift. It, it can be, yeah. It can also be the opposite. It can be very difficult. It can be very the uncertainty can almost if someone it, I think if I was in my really the darkest days that I that I experienced, if someone said you just got to get through it till then. It was like, okay, I can do that. Like there's an out. I think the biggest pain was like the uncertainty of this is where I am. And maybe this is the rest of my life. Maybe I'll never get out of here. It drives and you mad. That's yeah. That's, that can really drive you crazy. So I think the, the big point to drive home is have hope. Your body is self-healing. Your body is self-regulating. It knows exactly what it's doing. It's trying. No, it's not trying. It is right now. It is giving you the highest level of health attainable in your current environment. And your environment yes. being your gut flora, your diet, the thoughts you think, the people that you're around, the emotions you feel is everything, every single environmental factor. Your body is doing the best it can to keep you as healthy as possible as it can right now. So it's doing it. And if you can tap into that and you can see that and you can understand that, you'll see how just as you've got that level of health that you have right now, that can grow to overcoming anything. I've seen like almost miraculous recoveries from 
all different types of diagnosis, chronic illness. I know that you, you're not yes. a huge fan of, of labels and diagnosis, Emily, but could you share a little bit about what you went through so people can really understand the magnitude of <laughs> what you were dealing with? Uh, yeah, this is really fascinating. I had all kinds of labels. So Lyme's, MS, lupus, Hashimoto's, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, in the beginning, they thought lymphoma, abandoned that, sort of went to this autoimmune thing. So it was really all over the map. Mm -hmm. And my journey, <laughs> and it was interesting because like, I still remember the first time I ever went to the hospital, I was in such denial that I was, my health was declining. I was 18 years old. I couldn't climb a flight of stairs without pausing mm -hmm. and like <sighs> winded yeah. and sitting, I was in pain. And I was so gaslit in my reality that I thought that was just normal. So when I actually, when I first went to the hospital and they admitted me, it was like, oh my God, like there's no way, there's no way this could be happening. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of continued to unfold of like, my case was extremely atypical on like every test, every single mm -hmm. thing was like, you're the 1% of the 1% <laughs> you can't pinpoint what this is. And it was like, all right, well, you kind of fall in this category and you kind of fall in this one over here. So we're going to treat you like this, but maybe pull some things from this area. Um, <laughs> and now, you know, if I were to go to the doctor, they'd probably honestly tell me it never existed because there's yes. this paradigm of like, you can't heal MS, mm -hmm. you can't heal all of these different mm -hmm. things. So then it's like, you know, oh, well, we must we have, must made have mistakes misdiagnosed along the way. you or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. so it was, I didn't know, which for me was, it was a blessing and a curse. It was terrifying when I was in it because, and especially when I was in that place of outsourcing and depending on doctors to know, and they're telling you, we don't know, and mm -hmm. we don't know how to help. It was like world collapsing, mm -hmm. but also on the back end now, I feel like it was a gift from this perspective in that I never got super identified mm -hmm. with any one diagnosis so I don't feel like I got as boxed in mm -hmm. by the limitations that that can impose mm -hmm. yeah that some people do and I mean to give context to I was I was relentless in my search for healing I, I was in California when this all happened and when I, I you know living in a small town, county hospital, I knew that the healthcare wasn't great. So then it was like, okay, how do I find the best doctors in the state? I'm going to see those. And mm -hmm. then it was like, how do I find the best doctors in the country? I'm going to see those. And when that didn't work, I started going to other countries. How do I see those? So I, I say this just to give context mm -hmm. to um, how fallible medicine can be mm -hmm. in a certain sense. And even though, you know, you may be seeing the, the best of the best and no matter how far you go at the end of the day, it really comes mm -hmm. back to, are you doing what you can for your healing? Are you being mm -hmm. your own best advocate? And, and I'm, I'm not even saying necessarily don't find practitioners, don't find doctors. Like there can be a time and place on that for the journey. It's just make sure that you are accessing them as a support piece and not as a God over your that's healing. That's huge. It, I, find, I find that's a really helpful tip and you can apply that to everything is look at the energy behind what you're doing. Are yes. you disempowered or are you empowered through doing this? Are you looking for someone for support or are you outsourcing all of your, your trust, your healing, your, your, your certainty are you putting that on them and you're outsourcing it because if you do that it's not going to work for you it's going to have a negative or maybe it's not going to have a negative it's not going to be as positive whereas if you go into something with an energy of this is my responsibility i'm going to solve this and they're just going to help me i can tell you like firsthand i've worked with hundreds of different people and the energy that somebody has when they come to me is significant factor in determining the outcome that they have when they leave it's yes monumentally 100%. different and 
<clears throat> I'm guessing too, like <laughs> as a practitioner, you probably relate to this, seeing so many different people now, you know, almost right off. Like, yes, where they're at, whether they're going to heal, whether they're not. I, exactly. I, I had one of my, one of my clients recently and she was like, oh, I'm having a flare up. Everything's going wrong. It's like, what's, what's happening? I'm like, I, I'm certain because I, because I've worked with her for a while. I said, I'm certain if we never speak again, if you don't, you stop working with me, you don't, I, we never even talk. I'm absolutely certain that your healing is a when, not an if it's going to happen. It's just a matter of you figuring out how to get there. It's like, I can, I can, you're right. I can definitely feel that it's, I can, I can really feel it. And I can see when someone is going to have their chronic symptoms and they're going to have them for years before they move the energy into a place where they're going to actually be able to, to heal from them. And it's really sad because at that stage, there's absolutely nothing anybody can do for them. It's that person has to figure it out by themselves. No one can dig them out yes. of that hole. They have to dig themselves out. It's, it's really sad. It kind of breaks my heart because they, they can come back, they can ask for help and I can just say, oh, there's nothing I can do right now. And it, it breaks my heart because I'm really in this to help reduce unnecessary suffering. That's like my, that's my, my piece. That's why I'm here because just like you, uh, I imagine with the level of suffering that you endured, that's a huge motivating factor to, to make sure that nobody ever has to experience that unnecessarily because oh, it's hugely. awful. <laughs> hugely. Hugely. Yeah. And it's, I will actually, there are <laughs> many people I have chosen not to work with and it, it does break my heart, but I would rather refer those people out because mm -hmm. There's something Cassie Huckabee talks about, um, applying the concept of the placebo effect to your practitioners in terms of, um, you know, our belief about something and the influence that has is to such a degree that it's like we control for that in high-end research mm -hmm. settings. But what people don't often think about is, are you working with a practitioner that actually believes you can heal? Because if you're working with someone that doesn't believe you have wow. uh, the capacity, the ability, the for whatever reason, they think that you can't heal, your practitioner has now become an obstacle that you have to overcome That's amazing. because of the effect that they are having through their belief on your situation. And there are some people, and this is, it, it, it's been a really humbling experience for my ego because I do believe that there is potential to heal everything. And mm -hmm. from a realistic perspective, there are people that I meet and I'm just like, oh man, like I, I don't think that I'm the practitioner mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. you in this. And I found that for me to be in my integrity, I have to be really honest of like, mm -hmm. when I look at someone and I don't feel like they're in a place where I'm going to be able to have a breakthrough with them. Um, it, it does no service to them for me to keep them as a client and be like trying to convince you mm -hmm. uh, that it's possible and convince mm -hmm. you of this paradigm. It's like, I would rather just re refer mm -hmm. you out. Or if you're, yeah. I, I guess it's this concept of like, if you're not committed to your own wellness and healing, then it doesn't matter how committed mm -hmm. your practitioners or your support team yeah. are. So. Very true. I can't. I can't fault you with anything. I absolutely agree. You, again, it's the, it's the responsibility thing, isn't it? It's the self-responsibility. The people yes. that usually are coming like that are often outsourcing the responsibility. The people that, I, 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 so let, let me see if I can uh, make, make a bet with you here. I would bet every single person that has come to you from a place of true self self-responsibility and owning all the responsibility i bet every single one that's come to you you've said yes we can do something yes yeah so absolutely that's it. it's the energy it really is so <laughs> you it's really really interesting how that works as a practitioner as well it's you have to be very careful with who you work with because it can turn into a nightmare because you really do want to help other people and it can be really hard as well with like flashy marketing and people promising like quick fixes and it's like when you really genuinely care and you actually really genuinely want to get people good results it's, it's really hard and it can be really hard when you're first starting out and maybe you don't have many clients yet money's a bit hard it's like you kind of want to work with people even if you can't get the results because you want the money and it's like it's a big battle with yourself and for me that was a huge part of my healing too it's about learning 
learning the hard lesson that you can't save everyone and you really have to choose your battles. You have to work with the people that you can actually help. And it, it actually all works out better for you in the end. It really, it really does. It's, it's all, it's all energetic. It's all about having that in alignment and making sure that you're, again, it's owning your own energy instead of outsourcing that in a way, if you're outsourcing your income or your financial security yes. to your clients, it's the same dynamic, just in a different way. So it's, it's interesting exactly. how it comes around. <laughs> oh, and it's the, you'll find the patterns of <laughs> how you relate to your health and to your healing are the same patterns that will show up in your business and your relationships, yeah. like all of these places. And I will, <laughs> to be honest, I will try my darndest now a lot of the time to talk people out of working with me. Yeah. <laughs> Not because I don't want to work with people, I really do, but because if you're in a place where, you know, you have the tools, capacity, whatever to do it on your own, like that, that is really my truest hope. Mm -hmm. My, my dream above dreams is that we return humanity to a place of sovereignty in their health. And I only want to work with someone at this point, that is a hard line for me. It's like, if you are outsourcing to me, I cannot work with you. I can only work with you if you see me as a support and not an authority figure, mm -hmm. because I, I want that ownership to be in the lap of my client. And I also want them to feel the value of that in their healing, where it, at the end of it, they don't look back and say, oh, Emily healed me. I didn't. Mm -hmm. You did. And I want them to, to feel that and have their hands in what they've created and transformed for themselves mm -hmm. and also in, you know, in the beginning as a practitioner, I used to kind of like feel like I have to hold back because mm -hmm. it was like, oh, if people know how much work or how much discomfort this is really going to take, like they're not going to want to do mm -hmm. it. And now it's like, I rip that bandaid off first thing out the <laughs> door, because if you're already not on board, I want to know that day one, mm -hmm. I don't want to get to, you know, week 10 and find that out when you're in the middle of a healing crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, uh, two, two questions to, to wrap us up. I like to ask these of all of my guests. So first of all, what is something that is almost universally applicable that everybody watch it just about, I mean, obviously there's exceptions, but just about everybody watching would be able to implement in their life right now to, to help them improve their lives in some way that is very cost-effective or preferably free great intention behind everything that you do sit down you can do it just with your healing or you can do it with your whole life ideally look at every single thing that's on your protocol your plan for healing and get crystal clear on your motivation for doing it what mm -hmm. is the deep reason behind and you're going to know that it's deep enough when it's something that you can feel there will be a depth of emotion attached to this because the quality of your why the quality of your intention is going to infuse everything and also because it informs the chemistry being created in your own body when you interact with something and the chemistry that we create internally will almost always trump the chemistry that we consume mm -hmm. because you're you know the basis of your nervous system is to keep you safe so if your nervous system is perceiving that something is unsafe and thus it's creating the chemistry to respond to a threat, it doesn't matter how many uh, healthy foods you mm -hmm. eat or anything like that, the own, your own chemistry is going to trump that. So the question I ask clients is, what are you giving to your medicine? What is mm. the quality of energy, emotion, presence, potency that you're showing up with? And are you available? Are you in a state to actually be able to receive that which you're interacting with? Okay. Very important. So this, this is multi applicable to everything. Costs you nothing. Look at your energy. Look at your intention. I really like that. That's yes. a really good one. So my second question would be, you enter an elevator and there's a very important political figure who has a lot of sway in government, politics, medical fields, all of these things. You've got 30 seconds in the elevator. He's receptive to anything you have to tell him. What do you have to tell him that he should he should do to change the way that the countries are run and how the health system works to 
what what would be the the big thing that you would want to convey to him 30 seconds it would be this concept of dismantling the concept of disease that we need to stop treating labels diseases and symptoms and we need to start supporting humans in wellness we need to cultivate a society if we're talking government level changes we need to create a society that is hospitable to humans because the honest truth is we don't have that right now. There is validity to the fact that when you are healing, you are fighting an uphill battle at some level in terms of society. Mm. So cultivating a society that is conducive to wellness in terms of its resources, environments, support structures. Wow. I think we should have a whole podcast on how we can actually go about doing that <laughs> because that's a good one to go into. Yes. Yes. Okay. So just as we wrap up, if anybody would like to contact you for any reason about maybe consults or products or services or anything that you have to offer, what would be the best way for them to get in contact with you to find out more? The best way would probably be through my Facebook page. You can always shoot me a message. Mm -hmm. You can find me on Instagram at livingwellness underscore Emily Simpson. You can find me at www.livingwellness.me. That's my website. I have a contact form. <clears throat> That's going to be under construction here a right. little bit shortly. So Instagram or Facebook, either one. <laughs> okay, so I'll leave links to all of that. You'll provide me all those links. I'll leave them below so everybody can can find those and contact you if they if they need anything. Well, Perfect. thank you very much, Emily. This has been a very interesting um, podcast. I would love to have you on again at some point because I know we could just, honestly, I, I know we could have gone on for hours today. We could have gone <laughs> for three or four hours, I'd imagine, but we should uh, keep it keep it on topic and wrap it wrap it up while it's sweet but i would love to have you on again we've got so much we could talk about and thank you i really appreciate everything you do and thank you for coming that would be wonderful thank you so much i'm i'm so grateful to be here this has been wonderful well it's been our pleasure we will have you again soon sounds good bye 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 You've been listening to the Holistic Healing Collective with William Dickinson. Our passion is to heal with energy, holistic, and plant medicine using a science-based blend of mind, body, and spirit. We hope you've enjoyed the show, and we hope you've gotten some useful and practical information. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and tell a friend or two. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, find us on Facebook at the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast and support group. We'd love to see you. Take care, be well, and see you next time on the Holistic Healing Collective.